Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Bob and in this video series I'm going to show you how to program a Pokemon themed hunting game using Unity in which we're going to chase down some Psyducks. So this is a sneak peek of what the game will look like. We have a timer in the upright corner to catch ourselves a certain amount of Psyduck. We can jump, we can move the camera backwards, we can run faster and we can throw Pokeballs around. And if we manage to get in the way of Psyduck, Psyduck will respond to our actions. For instance, in this case Psyduck decides to flee. <laughs> and Psyduck will make some sound so that we can track them down based off of the audio that we are hearing because it will be placed in a 3D environment. Let's see if we can find... Oh, there's another Psyduck. So let's make sure that Psyduck doesn't see us and let's try to hit a Pokeball at them. I missed that one. That one is a good one. So the Pokeball will wiggle up to three times and Psyduck might escape or... Psyduck might get caught. So anyways, in general, that's the idea behind the game that we're going to be making. And while we're not going to spend a lot of time on Pokemon battles in a JRPG fashion, there is going to be a lot of cool things that we're going to pick up along the way. So I'm hope you're excited about this as much as I am. Let's roll the intro. So if you're watching this video series as part of my class, keep in mind that most of the content is also on the class website. These tutorials are actually here to help you if you get stuck with the challenges that I'm going to give you throughout the semester. Anyways, let's have a look at the software that we're going to be using. So for this project, we are going to use three software applications quite extensively. The first one is going to be our game engine. The second one is going to be our IDE. And the final one, which we'll use the least, will be a 3D modeling application. Now, Starting with the game engine, if you've never really developed any games yet, a game engine is a software application that takes control of most of the things you are going to do to create your game. Whether it's managing your assets, maybe how your lighting is handled in the game, there's the audio, special effects, a typical game engine also has a physics engine so you don't have to code all the physics manually. There is a module for animation typically, you can implement interactivity and there are many, many options to script your game engine. So for this project, we're going to be using the industry standard Unity, which is very popular. And you can find the license for it by going to unity.com slash product slash unity hyphen student, where you can sign up for the Unity student plan by clicking here and get a free license that you can use to get better at Unity and learn what it's all about. Next, we are going to use an IDE or an integrated software development environment, which is an application that assists programmers with everything that comes with writing a computer program. It will increase your productivity because now you can do everything that's important to programming in this one application, whether you're talking about writing your code and scripting or running executables or you're debugging and so on, your IDE has you covered. For this project, we're going to be using Rider by JetBrains, but there are many other IDEs that you could be using, such as Visual Studio being a very popular one with Unity. However, I do recommend that you download Rider for this class and that you follow along because I will be using it and I'll show you a lot of tips and tricks along the way. You can get a free educational license for it as well by going to this URL up here and then just signing up and that should get you covered. Finally, the third application that we're going to be using is at some point we're going to have to mess a bit with some 3D models and Blender is entirely free open source software that you can use for that specific purpose. So download a copy and install it on your computer as well. Now, if any of this ends up being daunting because, I don't know, you get in trouble trying to install these things, I will provide some third-party up-to-date videos with the course materials with the class as well so that you can follow along with those if you run into any issues. Furthermore, at this point, I also want to point out that as you are going through these tutorials, make sure to get backups in some kind of capacity. I'm fine with you just making a copy of your project at the end of every tutorial video, maybe saving it as a compressed archive, whether it's a zip or a RAR file, I don't really care. But you could also set up version control. I'm not gonna show you how to do that, but you can implement any CVS that you like, whether it's GitHub or Perforce, it doesn't really matter. As long as your project and your work is somewhere in the cloud that if your computer fails on you, that you can still recover a copy of it and you don't lose everything you've been working on. And with that friendly public service announcement out of the way, let's have a look at what those applications look like and get a quick overview of their interfaces for the remainder of this video. 
So let's start with Unity and we're just going to create a new project briefly. You can pretty much create any kind of project that you like, just pick a 3D one. For instance, I'll do an MD3D project using Unity's built-in renderer and just click on create project and it'll make a new project called my project, which will take a couple of seconds to load. I'm just going to fast forward it, but don't be surprised if it takes a little bit longer than this on your computer. And this is what that will look like once everything has been loaded. It took about uh, 30 seconds to a minute for me. So anyways, what I quickly wanted to run you through with this video is pretty much what's in this interface. So we have a couple of things that you might see right away, such as the scene. So the scene is where all the 3D objects of our game will go. Right now, there aren't too many of them because it's an empty project, but we do have some lighting here and we do have a camera in here. And any object that we are going to create and that we're going to put in this scene is going to be part of our game. Now, there are some tools here that we can use to move the view of our scene around. And there is a tool as well, the move tool that we can use to move the objects in our scene around according to the various axes. We can also rotate, which is this one here, and scale, which is that one. And these are the ones that you'll end up using most. But up here we have the, the rec tool and here we have the transform tool in case that ends up being useful at some point as well. But I'm not going to go too much into that right now. Then we have a gizmo up here that you can use to log the view of your scene to a specific axis and that can be very helpful as well. If you right click it, you can set different perspective modes and mess around with it a little bit as well. Anyways, I'm going to turn on my keyboard overlay here and now you'll see what I'll be able to do. So when I'm right clicking, my icon in the scene will turn into a little eye and then I can use WASD to move around the scene and Q and E to raise and lower the view of my scene. So that is usually how we navigate here. You can use this little icon with the camera to set the speed and the acceleration and mess with the field of view in case you feel that it's not up to par. But using those controls, you should be able to move around the scene pretty easily. Next up, we have the game view. So the game view is actually attached to the specific game camera, the main camera of your game. So what that is seeing is what we will see in the game view. You can't really mess with it until you press the play button, which will actually play the game, but we'll look into that at some other point. Okay, then we have the hierarchy. In the hierarchy, we can create new objects that are gonna go straight into our game scene. For instance, if we want to create a cube, we can just create a cube. And now we have a cube. Now, everything that's in here are game objects. And that's not just me saying that these are objects that are in the game. That's actually a technical term that is part of the Unity game engine. It's a class with a whole bunch of different properties that are represented in the inspector. So for instance, a camera has properties such as position, rotation, scale, which is referred to as a transform. And every game object will have these same properties as well because that's how they are positioned in the game world. However, a camera also has other things such as a skybox, such as a, a field of view axis, such as clipping planes, all things that we will look at in due time. Uh, just to give you an idea that different game objects can have different properties. For instance, if we select the cube here, we'll see that none of those camera properties are there anymore, but now there is a mesh filter, a mesh renderer, and a box collider that is associated with the cube. Anyways, the cube will also help us to show what's in the camera view, because if we click on our main camera here again, you'll see in the little preview here that this is what our camera is pointed at. And we could mess around a little bit with that, for instance, by rotating our camera and <laughs> moving them around the axis a little bit until we get a nice view of our cube. And then we'll see that in our game view as well. So anyways, that's a quick overview of the hierarchy, the scene and the game views that you have, as well as the inspector where you can mess with a lot of options. Because if we're going to start moving these things around here, you'll see that these values are changing in the inspector as well. We can mess with these using code, but we can also mess with them directly, which can sometimes be very convenient. Let's say we want our camera to be directly at a Y value of three. We can set it that way. So very convenient tools the inspector alongside with the hierarchy. Next up, we've got your project view down here and that really contains everything that's in your project. Now, right now it's not a lot, it's one scene and the scene itself is what we see in our scene. It's called sample scene and that's what most games start with. However, what we could do for instance is we could grab any game object, drag it in there and it'll turn into a prefab. So it becomes kind of like a blueprint for other instances of that specific game object. So if we want to have another cube that's exactly like this cube in many ways, we can just start dragging them out now from our project. 
And this is where we will store all the assets for our games, whether it's audio files, textures, um, 3D models, and so forth. I'll explain what all those things are if, if you're not too familiar with making games yet. But that is basically what our project is. It's a space where we manage all the different elements that come together, whether it is a mesh, a texture, a script, an audio file that will be used to make our game. Then there's the console window, and the console window will tell us whenever we're doing something that the game engine doesn't know how to interpret. For instance, if we are getting, and right now we're getting an error because the game engine cannot access the disposed object because the stream has already been closed. I don't know when exactly it popped up or what I did. In this case, we can just clear it and not worry too much about it. Sometimes Unity will throw that error up as we are moving things around in the environment. But in general, if we have errors in our code, the console will let us know and they will be warnings or errors depending on the gravity of them. Another thing that I would like to point out about Unity as you're looking at it, make sure you're signed in here in this tab. My account, I'm signed in as under my name, but you want to make sure that you have yourself signed in here because otherwise certain elements might not work perfectly. For instance, the asset store, which is right up here, contains all many, many, many assets that you can use to create a game from. For instance, if we click on 3D assets, you'll see that here is a pack with mountain environment textures. Here is a free sort that you can download in your game for using with your game. Here is a marine paratrooper in case that's what your game about. So you can, and I'll show you this in a different video, but through the asset store, you can get a bunch of items that you can use in game, whether it's code, whether it's assets like the paratrooper. And with that, there's also a package manager and the package manager opened in another window for me. But the package manager allows you to install more software. Um, there's lots of different things that you can install. For instance, the JetBrain Writer Editor, which is a package that will allow JetBrain's Writer, which we're going to look at in a minute, to communicate with Unity. So you will probably have this already installed if you install JetBrain alongside Unity. But if you haven't, you can find it in the package manager by searching for it. And there's many other packages that you can find here. For instance, if I type in, I don't know, animation or something, Oh, there are no results because packages in project, but if I look at the Unity registry, you'll see that there is a lot of different things that I can download, um, many of which pertain to 2D animation, for instance, right up here. So yeah, you can type in whatever you think you might need for your project and see what packages Unity offers. Here's one to help you to rig your animations, which is something that I'll explain in another video, uh, or for 3D characters and animation, 2D animation, and so forth. So these are all extensions to the Unity software, if you will. Now, with that, I think that's enough information about Unity for now. I think it's time to move on to Writer. And to do that, I'm going to create a C-sharp script, um, which can have whatever name I like. And it's going to take a second while it compiles that. Now, one thing that's cool about Unity is if you have a game object, you can add many, many components to it. For instance, an audio source, which is the first option here. But here are so many different options that you can add to specific components. And one of those options is a script. So if we wanted to write code for a camera, all we have to do is drag a script to it. It will become a component. And whatever code is in that script will apply to this camera now. Now, to get the writer, all we have to do is double click on a script and then writer will try to open it. Now, at first it's gonna take a little while, the bigger your project, the longer it's gonna take, as writer is going to initialize everything that's in there and it's going to try to make sense of your code already. It will also tell you if your package needs an update, which is <laughs> the case for me right now, but for now, I'm not gonna do that um, <laughs> because I'm recording this video. Now, when Writer is done with doing what it does, you'll see that some words will have different colors on it. You can change the settings of the color by going to File Settings, as I just did. And I am using the Writer Melon Dark color theme. You can pick whatever theme you like, but for the purpose of this tutorial, it might be helpful to have the same colors because then the same types of things will have the same color. For instance, a namespace such as Unity Engine will be green while the name of a class will be yellow in the color scheme that I'm using. If you pick another one, the colors could be magenta for the namespace, for instance. With that, I'm also using a couple of more technical programming terms. If you're taking this class as part of, or if you're taking this tutorial series as part of my class, 
the prerequisite is that you've already taken a class on object-oriented programming, so I am not going to instruct in detail how object-oriented programming works. However, I've deliberately kept the complexity of this series as low as possible, as the goal here is to teach you how you program a game in Unity rather than how different software design patterns work and what are best practices for coding complicated things. But still, I want to give you a couple of really quick notes when working with C-sharp. So usually, and if we open up our scene here, we will see our cube prefab and the script that we made and the sample scene from Unity. So everything from Unity will already be hooked up to Rider right now. So usually if you add a C-sharp script through Rider, not a Unity script, you will be asked, okay, what would, do you want this script to be in? A lot of the times it's one class per script. So let's say we call this test class just for the sake of it. And this is what a default C sharp script will look like. It starts with a namespace that you give a name. And then there's a first public class here with the name that you just gave the file. So a namespace, if that's entirely new to you, it's not something you'll run into into Unity too much because usually you're working in the Unity namespace anyways. You're using the, the pre-built ones that come with it. So if I open up the script that Unity made for us, you'll see that we are using these three namespaces. One is Systems Collection, then there's System Collections gener Generic, and then there is the Unity Engine namespace. So what the namespace basically does is it will it, it's designed in a way to provide you a manner to keep one set of names separate from another so that you can within one namespace, a variable might exist that also exists in another namespace doing completely different things, right? So you can set up different namespaces in the way our test class is doing it by just writing namespace and then giving it a name. And you can then access them again from other scripts using the using keyword for it. So that's pretty much namespaces, but you, most of the time in Unity, um, unless you delve deeper in C-sharp programming, you're just going to be using the, the Unity Engine 1 and some other extensions depending on what type of script that you will be writing. Now, the most important class of Unity, let's talk about that, is mono behavior. And all the game objects are derived from the mono behavior parent class. So whenever you create a script that Unity is going to be using to mess about with the game objects. You want to make sure that it's a child, which you do with the colon, from mono behavior. Again, Unity will set it up that way for you. And as we go through the tutorial, it'll all make a lot of sense more. But that's something to keep in mind. If you are writing something, however, in C Sharp that doesn't require a game object, you don't need to use mono behavior. And you can just write your class like this where you're defining a class with whatever name and you don't need to put the colo mono behavior behind it. Okay, now assuming that you've already learned a little bit about object-oriented programming, I would imagine that you've heard about classes before. If you haven't, a class is actually one of the most important components in object-oriented programming. It has specific objects and properties and all the objects that you're going to get into your game are typically instances of one of these classes. So you can instantiate classes. You can even have classes that are child classes of parent classes, which means that all the properties of the parent class are going to be inherited by that child class. And you can run code when you construct a class or when you deconstruct a class and so forth and so forth. Now, we're going to get into that as we are going through the tutorials in a lot more detail. But what I want to show right now is how whenever you make a class in Unity, you want to you wanna inherit from the mono behavior class. And one of my favorite features about Rider is if you hover over anything that Rider can identify, is that you can pull up some external documentation for it really easily. So let's do that. And by clicking there, we go to the scripting manual page in the documentation of Unity for mono behavior. And there, all of a sudden, even if we don't know anything about mono behavior, it will explain how mono behavior is the base class that every Unity script is derived from. And when you use C sharp, you must explicitly derive from mono behavior. So if you want to work around those game objects that we were showing or that we were talking about earlier in this video, you want to use mono behavior to be able to manipulate them because there are already so many properties and different things embedded into mono behavior, all these things that your class will inherit from so that you can actually manipulate what's going on into Unity. Most importantly, there are two methods that you will already see 
set up in your class right here. There is the start one, which is called before the first frame update. So whenever an object in your game scene is brought to life for the very first time on the very first frame, just think about it as a movie where you have all these succession of frames for your animation to play out. Or if you play a lot of video games, literally the frames per second that you have, the very first frame, you will run whatever code you write within these two brackets under void start. So that's what the start method is for. The update method, however, does that every single frame. So if you want some code to repeat many, many times per second, oftentimes 30, 60, even more frames per second, so it can happen a lot of times per second, you can put it in the update method. And these methods exist because our class is derived from mono behavior. So that's the point of mono behavior, and that is why the script looks the way it does, and why the test class that we made that's not a Unity class doesn't have any of that stuff in there, because this is just a random C-sharp class that has nothing to do with Unity. However, if you want to add a Unity class here, you could use that as well and select Unity script, but I'm not going to do that now because we already have one set up for us here. Moving on to data types then, well, C-sharp has a lot of different data types, more than that there are being presented in the Unity manual on this specific page even. But we're mostly going to look into integers, floats, and strings for the code that we are going to be writing, with a little side note about doubles as well, probably. So while I pulled up that page, I already added a little bit of code behind the scenes, and I made an integer, a float, and a string in that are attached to my new behavior script class here. You don't have to copy this or anything. This is just purely as an example. So what you want to do in C-sharp when you are making variables is you have your variable name, which are labeled here by my, just for the sake of example, and you need to declare what type of variable you are making most of the time. So in this case, I am making an integer called my integer, and the value is literally six. Then I'm going to make a float called my float with a value of 2.5. And then I'm making a string called my string with a value of hider. Okay, now what might look a little bit out of place if you've never seen C-sharp before is that there is an F behind 2.5. Why is that? Well, um, the reason why you need to put an F behind the number, it's not storing 2.5F, it's storing 2.5, is because if you write 2.5, C sharp in this compiler needs to figure out what this value actually means, what that literal, as it's called, actually means. So in this case, C sharp will interpret this as a double, which is a larger version of a float, but not as a float. It's a different data type. So to make sure that our that our Unity application or, or C Sharp script is communicating that this is actually a float in the same way that we are writing here, we need to either add an F here, which will make it clear that it's a float, or we can cast by writing float in between, which will tell C Sharp that, hey, what's coming up next is a float. And you can do that with all the other ones as well, whether it's a string or an integer. So anyways, just a really quick overview of how you set up a variable just to get you comfortable before we actually start writing any code. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is because you've probably noticed that we were talking about public class, private integer, private float, public string. What is that about? Well, this is something you probably have heard of before if you've done object-oriented programming before, but these are access domains, really. They're access modifiers. So if we write private, in this case, that means that that variable can only be accessed within this class, within this script. If we write public, however, our other scripts that we might create can also access that variable. So it's just a way to keep your code nice and tidy, and you can actually reuse the same name as long as you're not making all of them public. So private stays within the scope in which it has been declared, while public is accessible by other scripts as well. To simplify things a lot. And there's there's other access modifiers as well, such as internal or protected and so forth. But in Unity, 90% of the time, you'll end up using private and public because those are the most common ones and they'll get the job done. So that's my C-sharp primer for now. You'll learn a lot more as we're going to be doing this tutorial, but at least it gives you some idea about namespaces, classes, methods, and the different data types that we have, as well as those two access modifiers in private and public. Now there's a lot more to it, such as events and, and conditions and loops, but those are pretty general programming principles. And I'll just 
introduce them as we are going to be using them to make the game. Anyways, time to talk a little bit about Rider, because Rider has a lot of cool features, Why, and that's why we are actually using this IDE. So first off, since I was just talking about events, conditions, and loops, Rider can actually write those types of things for you. So what you can do is anywhere you want, you can click on this button here, or you can press Alt Insert to generate code. And when you do that, you'll get a little menu with whatever code you want to generate. So in this case, let's say that we want to add an event here. Um, we can just click a Unity event. And all the events that are available through Mono Behavior will just pop up here, which is going to be super convenient because we can just easily look like, okay, what do we want to use? Do we want to do something with the mouse? Okay, how about on mouse over? Is that what we want? Well, maybe if we're doing an on mouse over, we also want to do an on mouse up. And you can just select them, click OK, and Rider will write that code for us. Another shorthand way of doing things is if you just start typing. For instance, let's say I want to create a for loop, which is a very common loop in, in programming. I could go to a place where it would be appropriate to have a for loop. If I try to make one up here, Rider is not going to want to let me make one because in the outside of a method in a class, you're basically only allowed to declare your variables, really. But if you go to a method such as the start method, we can just start typing for, and you'll see these black code blocks that are there to have Rider write some code for you. So if I double click this one or just press enter, you'll see that my for loop is being written for me. So usually a for loop starts at some point. So it's going to be an integer of i equals zero. And then as long as i is smaller than what my upper limit would be. So Rider is turning that into bright red. So I can be like, let's say five, add one to i and run this code every time we do our loop. So that's how we would have a for loop. And say I want to write a debug message in there. I could just write log for using the Unity logger, press enter, and I will get my debug.log written for me, and I can write a message in there. And if I run this code, it will, it will show hello there five times, once for zero, once for two, three, one, two, three, four, and well, it will shut down before we reach five. So that's how I can write a for loop a lot more efficiently in Writer. And I think that is a super cool feature. Another cool feature that you might have already noticed is that Writer has my entire Unity project right here. It also has all the packages that I'm using and a lot of other stuff that we we'll probably never end up using even. But you can see here how all my assets are here, my cube and so forth is there. However, there's also the structure tab and the structure tab right now is not really showing, oh, so I needed to click here. So it'll show me the variables that I've just declared separately and then my start and my update method. So if this becomes really, really long, I can just double click here to jump to these parts in my code. That'll save a ton of time. We can also see here that Rider is giving us errors and warnings. So all the errors that are coming in from Unity directly will also be written up here. So we got the two errors that I had when I, oh, I still haven't put that F back. So yeah, I have an error right now because I am declaring a float on the left side, but on the right side, I'm actually writing a double. So I want to put the F here and that will make that symbol go away. And I want to make sure that there is a number in between the point or the full stop and the F, uh, the period, because otherwise it doesn't make sense either. And we're getting a lot of other warnings as well. Usually the yellow warnings, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on because a lot of these are also just about optimizing your code. For instance, if you're looking at this one, you can double click them. It'll tell you using directive is not required by the code and can be safely removed. We are not using anything from the system namespace. So our script will work just fine if we just delete that. So that's what it's pretty much just telling you. Similarly, the field my integer here is assigned, but the value is never being used anywhere. So if I would write void start, okay, my integer equals my integer plus two, whoops, that warning will no longer be there. So writer helps us to optimize our code and to make it better, which can be super, super helpful and yeah, can really help us to save time debugging. Another wonderful feature of Rider is that if you make something public, that means that usually you will see it pop up in Unity. So if I go back to Unity, we will have to do a little compiling. And let's say I grab my cube object here and I put that script that I just created. 
Let's remove it from the camera here actually. And I'll put it on one cube. So I'll delete the extra cubes. And on this cube, I am going to put the new behavior script. Okay. So with that, you'll see that the script has a public variable called my string, and it has the value hi there, which is great. Now, if I would change this value at any point while I'm programming my game to something else, like for instance, something else, if we go back to writer, Eventually, <laughs> um, okay, let me make sure I save here first. Yep, as soon as you save, Ryder will tell you that it is something else in the editor. There's a unique change now. So I can click on this and then it'll tell me like, hey, in your sample scene, in that cube, you have set this value to something else. If I click it again and then open up Unity, the usages window will pop up and it'll direct me to where my string has been changed. And I can then right click it, um, or I can click it up here and click on reset, and that will reset everything again. And if I save this and go back to writer, it'll revert back to unchanged. So this will save you tons of time debugging because if you set a value in the editor and you're expecting another value from your code here, the editor will take precedence and you know, it will have priority and you might see outcomes that you would otherwise not be expecting. So this is a super helpful feature that Rider offers us in working with Unity for public variables or any kind of variable that's accessible from the inspector. Now, speaking of usages, Rider does an amazing job keeping track of where everything is declared. All you have to do, and I enabled the overlay so you can see me do it, is press the control button and then hover over anything and you'll see that it turns into a link. And if you click on the link, for instance, if I want to know where my integer from this method has been declared, I just have to click on it and see how Ryder just jumped up here. Now, obviously, this is a lot more useful when there's a lot more text in between, right? But we can also demonstrate that with any of the other stuff that we are using from mono behavior. So if I do this with mono behavior, it will actually open where mono behavior is being declared in Unity. And I can see all the underlying code there, which is absolutely amazing to really dive into your engine and to figure out how certain things are working. Another cool feature, because now we find ourselves in a, in a script that we didn't write any of our code of, is to press Control, Shift, and E, and that allows us to see our le recent locations, which can be super helpful. Here you'll see all the scripts that I've opened recently, and we can find whatever we were working on quite rapidly by doing that. For instance, here is our new behavior script, so I can just double click it. I mean, I could have also clicked on the tab here, obviously, but um, it's an easy way to gain access to where we originally were. Another good way to find your way around Rider is to press the Shift button twice, so Shift, Shift. And that will open up this interface, which will allow you to search pretty much anywhere you want. If you want to find a specific class, for instance, you can type it in there, a specific file, symbol, specific action, specific text. Whatever you're looking for, just pressing shift shift really rapidly will help you to find um, whatever it is. So yeah, Rider and Unity get along really, really well. And you can even do all your viewer debugging through Rider. For instance, let's say we want our code to run until we set my integer to my integer plus two. So what we can do is we can add a little breakpoint. So if you've never programmed anything before, that means that your code will stop executing when it gets here so that you can see what is going on with it. So if we press play now, after we've hooked up um, Unity to Rider by activating the debug icon here, and we press play, our code will run. There we go, we compiled, it'll run and it'll stop right here. And then we have the option to step over it, to step into it or step out to it again. And the cool thing is in the EDI, we can literally see all the information. So if I hover over my integer right now, I can see that right now here, my integer is equal to six. However, if we let this code execute, so we step into it and I hover over my integer again, now it has become eight. So by doing this, you can literally figure anything that might be wrong with your code by just looking at how the values are changing as you move along. And the cool thing is that you can even make these breakpoints conditional. So if I stop this again and I minimize it, 
if I right click on the breakpoint, I can actually put a condition in here. So I can put some code in there and have the breakpoint only activate whenever the code is, is being true. And that is really just the tip of an enormous, enormous iceberg. I'll provide some third party videos in the course materials with more tips and tricks on how you can use Rider to make programming a game in Unity a lot more efficient and a lot more fun, really. We haven't even discussed yet how Rider is just compiling your code while you are writing your code so that you don't have to wait too long whenever you're going back to Unity to try to test out your game. It's really a wonderful thing to do. Anyways, that brings us to the end of this video. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the graphics pipeline so that we can start working on our game as soon as possible. I hope to see you there. Bye-bye.